On the Rock and World of Geology Program 3, we'll go full speed ahead into the mouth of a volcano. You'll find out all about volcanoes and what causes them to erupt. We'll also look at lava, pyroclastic materials, and the infamous Ring of Fire. Next, we'll grab our umbrellas to check out weathering and erosion. We'll cover the different types of physical weathering processes like frost wedging, exfoliation, and thermal expansion. It's time for a pop quiz. Here's the question. What are the three main types of chemical weathering? Do you think you know? We'll give you the correct answer after the show. The Standard Deviants present The Rockin' World of Geology Starring Brad Aldous Galila Azrez Herschel Bleefeld, Jeremy Clavin, Tessa Monroe, Dana Rubinson, Gabrielle Smith, Malcolm Smith, Shannon Ward, and Jazz Mastin. Magma is liquid earth crust, which is composed of elements that come together to form minerals. Lava is just magma that's made it up through the earth's crust to the surface. Rocks that form from cooling magma or lava are called igneous rocks. Igneous is a general term that describes any rocks that form from magma or the accumulation of the stuff, like lava or ash, that oozes or shoots out of a volcano. There are two broad categories of igneous rock extrusive igneous rock, which forms from lava on the surface of the earth, and intrusive igneous rock, which forms from magma below the surface of the earth. Plutons are bodies of intrusive igneous rock. Magma cools beneath the earth's surface, and the lump of solid igneous rock that forms is called a pluton. There are two kinds of plutons, concordant plutons and discordant plutons. Concordant plutons lie parallel to the country rock, the layers of rock that were already there when the pluton formed. Discordant plutons cut across the layers of existing country rock. Magmas are divided into four categories based on their chemical composition. Felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. Each type of magma yields different types of igneous rocks. Silica is a compound composed of oxygen and silicon atoms. Magma rich in silica is called felsic magma. Besides silica, felsic magma contains a considerable amount of sodium, potassium, and aluminum. Felsic magma cools to form igneous rocks such as granite. Magma poorer in silica is called mafic magma. Mafic magma and the igneous rock it forms are rich in minerals containing iron and magnesium. Mafic minerals composed largely of iron and magnesium are called ferromagnesian minerals. Pyroxene and amphibole are ferromagnesian minerals. As you might expect, intermediate magma has a mineral composition that's richer in silica than mafic magma and poorer in silica than felsic magma. Finally, ultramafic rocks are even poorer in silica and richer in magnesium and iron than mafic magma. Section D, Volcanic Rocks and Processes. Now let's talk some more about extrusive igneous rocks. You know, rocks made from the lava and solid material that flows or shoots out of volcanoes. Here are some terms associated with volcanoes and their processes. Ah Ah and Pahoe Hoe describe two different categories of lava flow, and you have to learn about them, so get to it! Pahoe Hoe flows get their name from the Hawaiian word for ropey, because this type of flow has a ropey looking surface. No, really. Ropey. You know, like a bunch of ropes. Pahoehoe forms when congealed surface lava 
is dragged along over hot moving lava. The congealed part rolls over the hot part, forming folds that look like ropes, or sausages, or something like that. An a-a flow has a lumpier texture because it is thicker and more viscous than a pahoehoe flow. When it cools, the rock it forms can be sharp and treacherous. So ah-ah is the sound you'd make if you tried to walk barefoot across it. When a volcano erupts explosively, a bunch of junk spews out of it and hardens into what we call collectively pyroclastic materials. Pyroclastic materials include ash, pumice, and tough. Ash is defined more by its size than by its composition. Ash is anything that shoots out of a volcano that's two millimeters or less in diameter. It's that little stuff. And that's easy to remember because we always think of ash as being fine in texture. Now, pumice is... is it's the rock you use to file the calluses on your feet. Pardon me? Pumice is the rock that you use to file the calluses on your feet. Pumice is a form of volcanic glass that's filled with holes that form when gases escape from lava. Some pumice forms as a hardening crust on a lava flow, and other times, pumice is ejected directly from an explosive eruption. And that's tuff. Tuff is a different type of igneous rock formed by the consolidation of ash. Remember, igneous rocks form either from cooled lava or magma, or from ash and pyroclastic materials that spew out of volcanoes. Sometimes the ash is so hot when it shoots out of the volcano that it fuses into a rock as soon as it comes together. When that happens, the tuff is called welded tuff. Welded tuff is more compact and has less open pore space than tuff. In fact, the grains of welded tuff are welded together to the point that it may look like glass. Now let's talk about volcanic edifices. A volcanic edifice is the physical structure of the volcano, its shape, and how it's formed. The shape is determined by the type and consistency of the magma that's forced out of it. Basaltic lava, which is another term for mafic lava, isn't very thick and viscous. Remember, mafic lava has less silica than felsic lava. Silica makes lava thick and viscous, Less silica means thinner, runnier lava. When runny basaltic lava comes out of a volcano, it spreads out in thin layers, producing a broad volcanic edifice called a shield volcano. Shield volcanoes are low and rounded, like a shield lying on the ground with the convex side facing up. Shield volcano eruptions aren't usually terribly explosive, so they aren't as dangerous as other types of volcanoes. That's lucky for Hawaiians because most of the Hawaiian volcanoes are shield volcanoes. Felsic lava is more thick and viscous than mafic lava. Why is that? Because it contains more silica. You know, that compound of oxygen and silicon? And silica makes it more thick and sticky. Felsic lava forms some pretty distinctive features in the landscape. The big, concave-sided, symmetrical edifices we typically associate with volcanoes are called composite volcanoes, or stratovolcanoes, strato, like strata, for layers. These monsters generally erupt thick, felsic lava with explosive force. Mount St. Helens in Washington State is a composite volcano. The insides of composite, or stratovolcanoes, are layered with lava and pyroclastic material. Pyroclastic material is stuff like ash, little bits of volcanic glass, hardened bits of all the junk that spews out of volcanoes. The pyroclastic material builds up inside the volcano, alternating with layers of lava. When the volcano erupts, the lava and the hardened pyroclastic materials come flying out. Cinder cones are volcanic edifices that form from the buildup of pyroclastic materials. Ash and little hot stuff that looks like cinders shoot out of a vent or opening in the ground, and then they fall back down around the vent, forming a steep-sided cone. These cones can grow pretty fast during an eruption, but they'll probably never get more than 400 meters high. You can often find cinder cones on the side of bigger volcanoes, like composite volcanoes, where smaller vents on the volcano's flanks spew lava and form a buildup of pyroclasts around the vent. Finally, 
Fissure eruptions ooze lava that's so runny it never forms a volcanic edifice. This runny, mafic, silica poor lava spreads out to form basalt plateaus, which are broad areas covered with hardened mafic lava. The Columbia River Plateau in the U.S., all of East Africa, much of northern India, nearly all of the ocean floor, and most of the island of Iceland are composed of huge basalt lava flows that erupted from fissures in the ground. Reykjavik, Stig is Schulmer, Hafner, Fjörder. An eruption of hot ash, dust fragments, and gases that proceeds downhill with great speed and devastating effects is called a nuée ardente. If you see one of these coming, run. In 1902, Mount Pele in Martinique erupted, producing a nuée ardente. A cloud of gas and debris exploded out of the volcano. It traveled at about 100 miles per hour and wreaked tremendous havoc. The layman's word for this phenomenon is disaster. Okay, so in the U.S., we have the Hawaiian volcanoes, and there are a few in the Pacific Northwest. I, I know that, but how come there are no volcanoes in Washington, D.C.? Well, there's too much red tape. It'd be very difficult to get them through the confirmation process. Come on. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. It's a, it's a little joke. Um, have you ever heard of plate tectonics? Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the theory that the outer part of the Earth is divided up into, like, big plates, and they, mm -hmm. they move around a little, right? <laughs> that's a simple way to put it. Uh, think about it this way. The two outermost layers of the Earth are called the crust yeah. and the upper mantle. These two layers together are collectively called the lithosphere. Okay? Now the lithosphere is divided into a series of continent-sized plates that can move toward each other, away from each other, or slide past each other. When these plates move, they can cause volcanoes and earthquakes, and they can even form mountain ranges. So that's why there aren't any volcanoes in Washington, D.C. I don't get it. Well, uh, most of the Earth's volcanoes are at or near the plate boundaries where the edges of two plates move toward or away from each other and allow some magma to escape from deeper in the Earth. About 80% of all volcanoes occur at boundaries where the plates come together. 15% occur at boundaries where the plates separate from each other, and only the remaining 5% occur within the actual plates. There aren't any plate boundaries in Washington, D.C., so no volcanoes. There are two major volcano belts. The Ring of Fire in the Pacific contains 60% of all active volcanoes. Another 20% are in the Mediterranean belt. And most of the rest are located on mid-oceanic ridges, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which, as its name implies, runs right down the center of the Atlantic Ocean. Geologists have some luck predicting volcanic eruptions, but there's not much chance that humans will ever be able to control volcanoes. So don't try. Here's our advice. If you see a volcano erupting, run. Because not only do volcanoes spew hot lava and ash everywhere, they also muck up the atmosphere with dust and noxious gases. All the dust they cough up blocks sunlight and can actually reduce the temperature here on Earth. We would like to make something absolutely clear. Though we tell you to run if you see a volcano erupting, the truth is, if you can see the eruption, you aren't going to be able to outrun it. You're toast! You're going to bite the big one, buried under a mountain of ash or choked by poison vapor. Yeah, I'm burning, burning, burning. Dig me up, baby, with one of them little toothbrushes. Dusting off the dirt, little multi-layer toothbrush. Section E, weathering and erosion. Weathering is the disintegration and chemical alteration of the rocks on the surface of the Earth. There are two components of weathering. The first component is physical weathering, which is the physical breaking of rocks into smaller pieces. Physical weathering is also called mechanical weathering. The second component of weathering is chemical weathering, which is the chemical reaction of rocks with their surroundings. These two components of weathering occur simultaneously. Let's talk about physical weathering first. Physical or mechanical weathering physically breaks rocks up into smaller pieces. There are several forces that work to break rocks up. They include frost wedging, exfoliation, thermal expansion and contraction, 
and highway workers with large explosive devices. Frost wedging occurs when rock cracks fill with water. The water freezes and expands, prying the rock apart. Frost wedging is responsible for potholes on roads as well. A small crack in the road gets bigger when water gets into it and freezes and thaws a few times. Exfoliation is when rounded sheets of rock peel off rocks or outcrops. An outcrop is just the part of a rock formation that's sticking out of the ground. Exfoliation is a lot like layers falling off a big onion. It happens to rocks that have what are called sheet joints, which are fractures that run more or less parallel to the surface of the rock. When these fractures break, you get exfoliation. Rounded sheet-like pieces fall off, producing a rounded blob of rock called an exfoliation dome. Thermal expansion and contraction is weathering attributed to the daily cycle of temperature change. When the temperature goes up, rock expands. When the temperature goes down, it contracts. In most places, this expansion and contraction happens on a small scale every day. Rocks are poor conductors of heat, so the outside of the rock heats up and expands more than the inside, eventually weakening the rock's outer shell. When a large rock breaks into smaller pieces, it has a greater surface area. In other words, parts of rock that used to be inside the big rock are now the outer surface of the smaller rocks. Weathering processes generally affect the surface of rocks, so weathering has a sort of snowball effect. Initial weathering produces more surface area. More surface area means more space for the weathering processes to continue their job. It's just a big cycle. Now on to chemical weathering. Chemical weathering decomposes rock and minerals through chemical reactions between the rock and its environment. Chemical weathering processes include dissolution, oxidation, and hydrolysis. Dissolution is the breakdown of minerals into their component elements. Most minerals don't dissolve very much in pure water, but add a little acid to that water and much more mineral dissolves. As minerals break down and dissolve in the presence of acid, the rocks break down too. Limestone just flat out dissolves in the presence of acid, so acid rain has caused some serious destruction of limestone. The next process, oxidation, is really just rusting. Oxidation is a reaction involving oxygen, often oxygen dissolved in water. Oxidation contributes a lot to the weathering of ferromagnesian minerals like olivine and pyroxene. Remember, ferromagnesian minerals are mafic, containing plenty of iron and magnesium. The iron in these minerals react with oxygen to form a reddish-brown oxide called hematite, or a yellowish-brown hydroxide called limonite. Reddish soils and sedimentary rocks may contain small bits of hematite or limonite. Oxidation is the chemical process most likely to weather iron-containing minerals. Minerals containing lots of silica, on the other hand, are most likely dissolved by a process called hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is a special kind of dissolution reaction in which excess protons or hydroxyl ions are left in a solution at the end of the reaction. In short, hydrolysis is just the term for the reaction of a mineral with water. That's easy to remember because you probably know that hydro means water. The positive hydrogen ions and the negative hydroxyl ions in water react with the ions in the minerals. During hydrolysis, positive hydrogen ions actually replace the positive ions in the minerals changing the minerals composition. The negative hydroxyl ions just get left behind in the solution. Like we said, this reaction happens most often with silicates like feldspar. Hydrolysis breaks down feldspar into clay. Remember Bowen's reaction series? The minerals that crystallize later in the series like biotite mica and sodium rich plagioclase are more stable in the weathering environment than those that crystallize early in the process, like olivine and pyroxene. When we say that these later forming minerals are more stable, we mean that they're less likely to react with the elements around them when they are exposed to water and the atmosphere, so they aren't as affected by chemical weathering. 
A rock's susceptibility to weathering is determined by both its structure and its environment. A rock's structure is its physical form. For example, if a rock has joints or fractures, it's more susceptible to physical weathering, like frost wedging, because the joints and fractures allow water to seep into the rocks. You remember that frost wedging occurs when the water in the cracks freezes and thaws, expanding the cracks in the rocks and causing them to eventually break up. Rocks that are less susceptible to joints and fractures will be less susceptible to frost wedging. This is an example of how a rock's structure affects how it weathers. Is it true that some rocks are predisposed to weathering? Some rocks are predisposed to weathering, it's true. But other rocks are victims of their upbringing. You have to be kind. Uh, uh, some rocks are affected by weathering simply because of their environment. A rock's environment affects how it weathers too, in a couple of ways. Higher temperatures speed up reactions, so rocks in a hotter climate are often more weathered than rocks in a cold climate. More important than temperature, however, is the abundance of water in the environment. With a higher flux of water moving through the environment, more mineral can dissolve or hydrolyze, so more weathering occurs. How does water moving through the environment cause more weathering? In several ways. For one thing, water carries chemicals like acid that dissolve rock, and the water itself is a chemical weathering agent as well. Water is also responsible for some physical weathering like frost wedging. Ooh, cold! Also, the topography or the physical features of the land around the rock influences weathering. For example, an exposed rock on a steep mountain is less protected from rain and frost than a rock in a low land. You know that when rocks weather, they break down into little pieces. Erosion is the process by which these little pieces get carried off and scattered around. There are various agents of erosion. These agents, including wind, water, ice, and gravity, all contribute to the erosion or carrying off of weathered particles of rock. Mass wasting, also called mass movements. Like when... It, 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 look, mass movements is the downhill movement. Falling, sliding, flowing. Yes, it's the general downhill movement of soil, mud, rocks, and that sort of thing. Look, we're talking about soil and rocks and stuff that move downhill because of gravity's pull. Weathering breaks things up into smaller pieces and then the agents of erosion get a hold of the materials and, aided by the force of gravity, it all moves downhill. That's mass wasting or mass movement. By the way, the hill doesn't have to be steep at all for this to happen. In fact, sometimes mass movement happens on land that is nearly level. When the downhill movement happens slowly, like 1 to 10 millimeters per year, it's called creep. Ooh, creep. When it happens fast, we call it an avalanche, a mudslide, or a landslide. Believe it or not, in the long run, creep usually causes more overall property damage than landslides. But that's not to say that landslides aren't huge acts of nature. Ever see a sign like this? Did you think it might be warning you of some local bratty kid who stands on the hill and hurls rocks at cars? Well, if you thought that, you are wrong. A rock fall, individual rocks loosened by chemical and physical weathering fall from a steep mountainside or cliff to the ground below. In some cold regions, the top layers of soil freeze and thaw and the underlying layers stay frozen solid. The freezing and thawing upper layers tend to stay saturated with water and when they thaw, they slide downhill over the frozen underlayer. When saturated layers of upper soil ooze downhill over frozen layers, they carry debris and junk downhill with them. This phenomenon is called solifluxion. Solifluxion contributes to mass wasting. Let's review. Weathering is the disintegration and chemical alteration of the rocks on the surface of the Earth. There are two types of weathering, physical and chemical. Physical weathering, also called mechanical weathering, physically breaks rocks up into smaller pieces. Frost wedging, exfoliation, and thermal expansion and contraction are physical weathering processes. 
Chemical weathering decomposes rock through chemical reactions between the rock and its environment. Dissolution, oxidation, and hydrolysis are chemical weathering processes. Physical and chemical weathering occur simultaneously. simultaneously. A rock's susceptibility to weathering is determined by both its structure or physical form and by the conditions of its environment. See if you can guess the phrase before time runs out. Here's a clue. It's a type of physical weathering. The answer is frost wedging. Here's to you if you got it right. Here comes the answer to the pop quiz. We ask, what are the three main types of chemical weathering? The correct answer is dissolution, oxidation, and hydrolysis. These three processes break down rocks and minerals through chemical reactions. 